Okay, hi everyone. Um, um, thank you for joining us today for Nicole O'Loughlin's Portraiture in Thread workshop over Zoom. Um, my name is Georgia Mack and I am the Exhibition and Engagement Manager at the Leicester Prize. Nicole will be running a two hour workshop today um, with some breaks in between. Um, we were talking about having a little question section at the end for the last 15 minutes, um, but Nicole will be managing that as she goes. Um, so Nicole O'Loughlin is an artist currently based in Hobart. She graduated from the Hobart School of Art in 2009 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts majoring in printmaking. As part of her undergraduate degree, she undertook a year-long study exchange at the Madrid School of Art in Spain. In 2015, she completed a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Fine Arts um, with first class honours at the Tasmanian College of the Arts in Printmaking. Nicole is a current PhD candidate at the School of Creative Arts and Media in Hobart. Her work and her work is held in numerous private and public collections. Um, thank you so much for being here, Nicole. And I'm going to hand this screen time over to you. Thanks, Georgia. Thank you for setting it all up. And thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, you know, online learning is what we're all doing at the moment. So we will make this work as much as we can. Um, as George was explaining, what I'll do is run through a presentation first. Um, if there's anything that's unclear, maybe yeah, interrupt me and ask a question or put it in the comment section and I can address it. Um, but we will have kind of an open session about half what once I do the presentation and kind of go through the basics, then we'll have an open stitch session. Um, but let me just share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that one? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, slideshow, there we go. <coughs> Okay, so you've all disappeared from me. So um, please do yell out if you have any questions. I can't see anyone now. <laughs> um, so firstly, I'd like to say thank you for coming along and I'd like to pay respects to the traditional and original owners of this land. Um, and I'm talking about the land that I live and work on. So the Muinawa people um, to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal people who are the custodians of this land. Um, so as both Georgia and myself have been talking about, today's workshop is based on just a brief introduction um, and sharing some tools and techniques that I use to do portraiture in thread. Um, I'm not formally trained in embroidery, so everything that I'm passing on to you is self-taught. So I just be aware that I don't follow the strict traditional embroidery rules. I kind of bend them and shape them a bit to how I work. So um, I'm sure some of you have got lots more experience than what I have in traditional embroidery. So just be aware that I'm, I'm not a traditional, I'm not a formally trained embroiderer. I'm actually formally trained in printmaking and teach that at the art school. So, um, so probably, I guess one of the most important things that I've found through embroidery and doing portraits is the stage one, um, the design and the planning. So uh, one of the important elements to studying your portrait is to have a good drawing, um, an illustration or a reference photo to work from. This is going to help you determine the structure of the embroidery and the colours that you will need for stitching. Uh, whilst I have um, given you a basic starting list for the workshop based on the lighter or the darker skin tones, um, there are obviously many variants that you could experiment with as well. Um, so you can use the variants of your favourite brand. Um, I tend to use DMC just because it's more accessible for me in Hobart. We don't have a lot of options. Um, 
personally, my favorite is the Cosmo, which is a J Japanese brand, but I can't get it um, so much of it here. Um, and another really handy tool for me is using the thread color chart to pick out my colors. So, um, and the, the reason that little square is on the picture of RuPaul is to kind of, when I'm picking out the colors of what I need to embroider or doing my color selection, um, focusing in on one little area often helps so that you can kind of zone in on a particular area and then compare it to the threads and work out your color scheme for your um, portrait or your image. Um, so yeah, remember you can experiment. So this one was of Grace Jones and it was based on her, one of her album covers and um, it was done in blue. I've done one Putty Smith, which is grey as well. So there's also, there's lots of artists. Um, there's Fiance Knowles who's on Instagram and she uses lots of really vibrant colours for embroidery as well. So you don't necessarily have to use the traditional skin tones, but I will be talking about that um, in this workshop a bit more kind of referencing those skin tones. Um, so stage two, once I've kind of developed a list of the colours that are in the image that I'm working from um, and kind of written my colour list of the embroidery threads, is drawing the design. Um, even if I'm kind of copying it directly from a reference photo or tracing, I still will draw elements of it and still draw into it. Um, it just helps me understand the structure of the portrait that I'm drawing. So there'll be reference lines um, in terms of the contours of the face or the patterns, as you can see in this one, the patterns of the hair. So how the um, hair might kind of cascade down or have a curve in it. And that just helps me with how I'm stitching. So I guess when you're stitching and you're trying to create shape with the embroidery thread, um, you, you're kind of stitching in a straight line, but then you're curving it around um, in, in different places to kind of create that idea of shape. Um, and I just want to emphasize that you don't have to be an excellent drawer. Um, you just need the right tools for drawing and for transferring. So a lot of the time I will draw in, trace the portrait um, in gray lead onto tracing paper sometimes, because um, that um, will come up in a little bit, but that's also helps me how I transfer the image. And so this allows me to define the key areas and knock back any elements in the reference photo that I don't want to include. Um, so on my sketches as well, I may make lines that tell me the contouring of the face, that is where the curves or the different features sit, and this will give me a reference as to the direction in which I will stitch. Um, so once you're happy with the drawing, then you can get it ready for transferring. So I'm only going to run through really briefly the transferring because I think um, it might be more valuable to go through um, the stitching process with you all. Uh, and to be honest, I've just moved house and most of my studio is all in boxes. So I don't have all of my uh, normal equipment that I would have to show you to all the different examples of how to transfer a design. Um, but I'll just run through kind of the three main F, um, uh, techniques that I use to transfer the design onto the material. And this is really a, um, kind of an experimentation with the material um, and the tools as well, because sometimes you will find, and this has happened a lot to me, that you'll go to transfer something on with one method, whether it be an eye and on transfer pen or pencil, um, and it doesn't work on the material or it doesn't give you a defined line. So um, these are the three kind of ways that I do. Um, so the first one is to trace the drawing on to acetate with a fine black marker. And so using a light box or even a window, trace the design onto the light cloth with a water soluble pen. Is it, it is a good idea to have the material stretched onto a frame, remembering to place the flattened side against the drawing light box or window. So that means that you have it um, so that it's kind of the reverse of how you would stitch it, that the flat areas got the closest surface to the, the drawing. Um, and the water soluble markers, are good in the fact that you know it's not permanent, you know they're acid free, they're not going to destroy your material. Some of the other methods um, like the iron on transfer pens or pencils 
they they're not don't have as good a reputation in terms of um, you can't get rid of them. So um, that can be a bit tricky if you've got a mark on there that you actually don't want or you're not going to cover with your stitching. That can be um, a bit annoying. So yeah, the next method is iron-on transfer. So it works well if you have dark or heavy materials you want to embroider onto. Although you will need to test on a sample piece that it will work onto the material. Um, some materials it works quite well, other materials it won't. Um, and so the way that I do that one is trace onto heavy tracing paper, the design, remembering that it will reverse in the process of when you transfer. Mm -hmm. So lay the transfer pen side down onto the fabric and iron over. Um, and this method, as I was just saying, doesn't wash out. So it is important that you are completely happy with the design and will cover all areas with the stitching. Um, and that's just a couple of examples of the methods. So the one which is the portrait of myself that's in the Leicester Prize, that was using the iron on transfer. Um, and then you can see the lighter blue, that's the water soluble marker that I've come back in to do some details. And then the RuPaul one was done with a permanent marker. Um, you know, that's always a bit risky and I don't like doing that, but this was on a artist linen. So there was really no other way that it was going, I was going to be able to draw onto it. You can use things like pencils as well, um, but you just want something that's not, that doesn't have a grain that's gonna sit because it will, the thread will pick it up as you're stitching. So you want something that's um, kind of absorbs into the material if you can. Um, whether that's washable or not. So stage four, getting your stitch on. <laughs> um, so this is the fun part, although some would say tedious and time consuming, consuming, but it's when you get to start stitching. So stretching your material onto your preferred frame or hoop. Um, if you're going to end up doing a lot of stitching, I recommend you get a stand to save your shoulders, arms and back because it can get quite hard trying to hold a hoop and stitch as well. Um, so make sure the material is taut but not too taut. Um, um, not too tight, sorry. And if you have a very light material, for example, a calico, you may need to back it with some interfacing or other material. So that will stop it puckering if you are doing a lot of stitching. So this is just an example um, of an embroidery hoop with a built-in stand. And the Q-snap frames, which are a quilting frame, is probably one of my um, preferred frames. Um, and I mean, that's just working with it um, clipped to the side of a table, that one. So they're called um, quilting frames. They're just like a polymer pipe. And then you've got the clips to clip it on and you can get a really nice tight um, kind of um, pull and stretch with those ones. Is everyone okay? No questions so far? Um, so most embroidery cotton will come in skeins, which consist of six threads that can be separated. Um, once I finish the presentation, I'll show you some examples, although I'm sure you probably all got it anyway. Um, I tend to divide mine up into two threads for um, portraiture stitching, uh, just because you can, the, the, the less, the finer thread, the more blending capabilities you have. Um, so the blending of colours together, the less threads, the more seamless it will appear. Um, but you can use, sometimes I will use three or some people use the whole six, so it produces different results and it may get the look that you want. Like some people really incorporate that and get a really um, chunky kind of look to their embroidery and that high contrast between the colours. So it can be quite dynamic and interesting as well. Um, so cutting threads is a general rule. The length of your forearm um, from the tips of your fingers to your elbow is good. Uh, too long and it'll knot up quite quickly. Too short and you're going to be repeatedly cutting um, your thread. Um, and so the knotting of the thread, a great tip that I was given by Maricora Marica, um, is the quilter's knot. And I'll show you how to do that once I finish the presentation as well once we get into the demonstration part. Um, but generally I will start by outlining the key areas of the portrait so that can help you defining where you need to stitch. And especially, I guess, if you're using a pen 
um, or a mark or a transfer for element that doesn't work so well or isn't as heavy as what you want. Getting in there and stitching the outline um, straight away helps you get the structure of the image as well. Um, so that's just using a straight stitch, which is just repeated stitch over and over again. You can come back into the previous stitch as well if you want a really refined line rather than a broken line. Um, and as well with that, um, the kind of the defining line, uh, the one that I'll use for that a lot of the time is the 3771, which was on the list of the recommended colours. That's a DMC thread. So it's just a nice dark brown. Um, it's not a black. Black can be quite heavy. Again, it's up to you if you want to use black, but um, the brown just works in with the portrait colours. It's like when the old masters used to use the umber um, colour to, to kind of define and do shadows and do that basic sketch of your portrait or your painting. Um, so, referring back to the colour chart that you um, formulate when you're kind of designing your image, um, so you define the areas that each section will be stitched in. So, talking um, about the shadows, the deep shadows, the mid-tones and the highlights. So it's kind of building up um, the, the kind of the different tonal variations in the portrait and using um, the stitch, which I'll go on to talk to uh, in a moment. Um, but it's just kind of that repeated, um, yeah, just repeating the colours and kind of blending them together to get the tonal variations in your portrait. So using a combination of long and short stitch. So the less threads you use, repeating again, the more blended the colours will appear. So you, you can kind of see there in the example um, that there's no really hard lines with all the colours. Um, no, my pointer works, but um, there's no kind of hard lines with the colours. Um, they're kind of mixing into each other. And the next slide will show that a bit more kind of the idea of the stitch. So the first, it's called a, a long and a short stitch. Um, and this image is from Trish Burr's book, uh, Colour Confidence, which is a really handy book. Um, so the first row of stitching is at various lengths. And so it's not all the same length. So you don't want kind of that defined um, line of your stitches or same um, length of your stitches. And the second row works back into the first row, again, at various lengths. Um, and then you just keep on repeating that process to blend all the colours together. And so just some more examples of that. So stitch lines follow the contour, contours of the face or body part. So you can see in that one, the Deborah Harry one on the red portrait, especially that cheek area, the lines are curving down. And so it kind of follows the shape of the body. Um, and as well in the fingers, the lines are kind of, they start to curve around when um, they're curving around the feature of the body. Um, so now, yeah, I just wanted to open it up to an open session and questions and I was going to do some stitching demonstration and just show you, but maybe if anyone has any questions first. Carol Cook, can you hear me? I don't know where um, Nicole's gone. Oh. Oh, yes, she's frozen. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a question, but I don't know if she can hear me or not. <laughs> oh, she's gone. She's frozen. Oh, she's just calling me. I'll just put myself on mute. Hold on. Okay. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, Nicole's computer just started to shut down, okay. but it's restarting as we speak. So she'll log back in. So everyone could just be a little bit patient. Um, I can see 
There are a few questions that have been written in the chat. Um, but when Nicole comes back, we'll start with, um, with you, Carol. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I'm, I'm an, I do embroidery as well, and I'm, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about her choice of fabric and um, if yeah. she always uses interfacing on the back or whether there's some fabrics that she doesn't. Yeah. And I would like to have a bit more information about the fabric that she uh, featured called, um, had, uh, what did she call it? I made notes, can't read them now. No worries. <laughs> um, artist Linen. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, it looks like she painted it and embroidered it. And I was wondering if she put um, back interfacing onto that. Okay, we'll ask her when she comes in. Where are you calling in from, Carol? I'm, I'm in Canberra. Oh, you're in Canberra. Yes. Nice. Thank and you. I, I follow Nicole um, with great passion. Her, her work is just staggeringly uh, um, innovative and large. It is. <laughs> um, it's, it's... Canberra actually has an open, it has a design month this month with ACT Craft. And so I have an open studio this weekend. Oh, so I've, I've stopped embroidering because I have to set up the gallery. <laughs> so I thought I'll just do this before I get back to it. <laughs> oh, well, that's exciting. And if there's anyone else here in Canberra. Kerry um, Martin is from Canberra, aren't you, Kerry? Oh, hi, Kerry. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully everyone can come visit you, Carol. Yes, well, they um, they have an open studio every Saturday over the month, and they all the all the textile or all, all the artists who opened up said that they had double the numbers. I think people yes. are stuck at home; they're not travelling overseas. Yeah, no one's travelling. So, yeah. so it's a bit more complicated now. We have to have a COVID receptionist, and we've had to measure our space and manage the numbers. Oh. But um, I'm sure it'll be a nice weekend. Oh, that's good. That's good. At least everyone can get out and about. Yes, oh. Canberra's been very lucky from that point of view. We're very grateful. That's good. And, and where are you? We're in Perth. Oh, Perth. And, um, yeah, we have a hard border, so no one can enter. That's okay. I have, a, I have a holiday planned for October next year, so I hope you can have it sorted out by then. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're going up to Geraldton. And um, does everyone know about the Leicester Prize? Mm-hmm. Um, so we're a portrait prize um, based in Western Australia and we exhibit at the Art Gallery of WA and um, you can see all of the works virtually um, and you can find the virtual exhibition on our website um, and you can all vote for the People's Choice Prize um, through the virtual gallery. So. Um, if you're a fan of Nicole, you can vote for her or you can vote for someone else. Um, so I don't know where Nicole is, but we'll just um, hang tight for a little bit longer. I might just text her. Oh, she's joined. I can't see her though. Oh, Nicole, I can see you. I can't hear you. We can't hear you yet, Nicole.
Oh, we have lots of people here. Everyone's commenting in the comment section where they're from. Um, just admitting Nicole in again. Okay, Nicole, what's happening? Where are you? Um, okay, I'm just gonna put myself on, wait, there she is. <laughs> okay, I've made you a co-host, Nicole, but we still can't hear you. Um... Has the computer not turning back on? No. <laughs> I don't know why we can't hear you. Oh. Is Can there you audio? hear me? Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe, like, <laughs> um, yeah, I just cannot believe my computer decided to die right then. That was... Such perfect timing. <laughs> um, so while you've been away from us, everyone's commented in the comments where they're from and they've got people from all over the world. Oh, wow. Argentina, I'm trying to get it started again. Chile, Oregon, South Australia, Los Angeles, Brooklyn, Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and we had a few questions come in. So there's one from Carol. Are you are you prepared to take the question, Nicole? Or yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing. Hang on a minute. I'm just going to try and. So is your computer broken? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we reschedule your computer? <laughs> It might be a good idea. It's just going to be really hard for me to do it on the... I mean, I can try. Um, I can't see everyone, though. So it's just... Um, yeah. Um, and the, I'm so, this is from my university computer. Um, and I don't know why it's decided to do this. And apparently it's happened before. It's why we stopped using Zoom was because it would just decide to update in the middle of it and kick people out of meetings and kick people out of tutorials. Um, so it's decided to do that to me today, um, which is great. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to take some questions while I still try and figure and see if I can get the, the computer working. Okay, well, let's just try. And if it doesn't work with questions, we'll just reschedule. Um, so, Carol, do you want to go first? Okay, maybe it's not working. Um, I've got a question here from Cecilia. According to your experience, um, do you recommend starting from shadows to light? Yeah, I do, um, Cecilia. I probably do tend to start from shadows to light. Um, I'll work the defining areas, so work out the lines, um, stitch in the lines for the nose and the eyes and um, lip lines. Don't I tend to have a habit of not filling them in until the last, but just defining those areas and then working from the shadow to the light. So, yeah, that's what I tend to work. I find that works quite well for me. Okay, um, if everyone wants to put their questions into the comments, I'll read them out. Um, Thank you. So there's one here that says, do you use any particular clamps 
with the Q snap? Um, so no, just they were just like plastic ones from Bunnings or something. Um, yeah, just you want something, if you are going to use clamps as well, just put some layers of fabric in to protect your embroidery. So just make sure that the embroidery is protected and because clamps tend to have um, kind of that ridged um, pad on it so it might damage your fabric so um, and as well if I ever am clipping it into any stands or anything um, so there's a few different stands that I'll use um, I'll have a protective layer around the rim so just if this was a stitched portrait I'd have another layer of um, fabric in here if this had stitching on it all over it just to protect the stitching and protect the um, the, the material as well Okay, we've got another question from Carol. Um, can, I, can I ask about fabric? I don't know this word. Choice, choice. Choice, oh, okay. Sorry. Um, about the fabric choice for painting and if there is one that you don't need to use interfacing. Yeah, so for painting, um, I tend to... So the linens have more of an open weave, so you can paint on them and then you can stitch on them quite easily. Um, recently, there's one of my portraits that's in the Salon de Refuses of the Archibald and that was on a cotton and that was a nightmare. I will never stitch on that again. <laughs> um, so it was a 12 ounce cotton, cotton, um, the artist cotton we're talking about. So I'm talking about linen and canvas. Um, for you'll find in art shops for people to paint onto. Um, so the cotton that's used for painting tends to be quite a tighter weave, whereas your linen, if it's an unprimed linen, then it can be a looser weave and you can tend to paint on it as well as stitch into it. But the cotton can be a bit trickier. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit hard to get your needle through. Um, I ended up using like huge needles to get it through there and even then it was still um, yeah, it's not as forgiving as what your linen weave is. Thank you. Does that help? Carol? Oh, Carol, you're on mute. I'll just unmute. There you go. Yes, thank you. I've been um, practicing with um, white calico, but I don't ah, yes. do such large pieces, but it takes the paint beautifully. And yep. of course, it's much easier to, to embroider. Um, mm. I don't like using interfacing because I, I don't tend to use a stand because my pieces yep. aren't good. But of course, if you have too much paint, you can't get the needle through anyway. So yep. I want to expand on my knowledge of that. So I was just wondering because you use, I've never used artist linen, I just grab calico. Yeah, <laughs> and you can use calico. Um, it, I mean, it depends how you're painting as well. Um, so any kind of material, if you are painting onto a material and you want the colours to really kind of sit on top, then you would prime it with something first and you could even use something like a glue um, just to give it that kind of surface so the paint doesn't soak into it. It'll make it stiffer and you'd probably then need to stretch it onto a frame and stitch it like within the frame and paint it within the frame. But if you wanted that washy kind of look, um, there's an artist, Jessica, um, or I can't remember her last name. She's an American one and she uses watercolor, but hers is quite washy. So she doesn't prime or do anything to her canvas. Um, so I guess it depends what look, but yeah, calico would work quite well, especially if you get a heavier one. I think that'd work really well. And be much easier to stitch through as well. Yeah, my fingers are getting a bit old, so <laughs> I yeah. don't want to be having to force each turn on the on the thing. So, um, and do you use acrylic? And do you put a medium in the paint? Um, I use acrylic, and I've used oil. Um, I, acrylic's easier because I guess it's not going to go anywhere, and it dries really fast. Um, and I'll turn, yeah, I'll put a, a medium in it if. Um, depending again what kind of effect I want so if you want um, it washy I mean on one of them I've used gouache as well so there's an acrylic gouache um, that you can use too um, so yeah it just depends on the effect that you want to use so experimentation I mean I guess the way that I kind of experimented with is it is I'd get different sections of material um get all my paints and then do dabs on each material and see yeah. what the effect is and yeah. then what 
what one works best. Yeah, yeah, I certainly do that because you don't mm. want to spend all that time and then go, God, that didn't work. Do yep. you ever do you ever use beading? Yes, yeah. So the RuPaul one I used beading and that was on an artist linen. Yeah. Right. So but you weren't wouldn't have been able to get the hoop around it with all the beading, would you? No. no. So some of my works I just stretch straight on to artist stretcher bar frames. Okay. So for the painting frames, just stretching them straight okay. on there and they pretty much stay on there. So I stretch them tight so that that's it. It makes it harder when they're bigger to stitch because you've got a bigger kind of um, area. I know you can't see my arms, but yeah, bigger so area to go around yeah. um, rather than something, you know, this small that you can navigate yeah. a lot easier. So yeah. I wouldn't recommend stretching them on massive frames. <laughs> I don't think my arms are long enough. <laughs> Thank you. I've taken up enough of your time. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Carol. Still Thanks, trying to get this Carol. computer to work. <laughs> no worries. You've got. I'm not sure if you already answered this question on from Amy. Um, do you ever stitch on heavy paper or always use fabric? Um, I haven't stitched on paper. I've stitched on a plastic bag. Um, but yeah, paper I haven't really done yet. Or I have, but I haven't had any successful results. It's something that I'd like to experiment with. Um, and I guess that would, the, I, the people that I've seen who have done it and done it successfully almost need to stab the holes into the paper first and then stitch it. So, um, because you don't have that weave for the needle to go through, uh, that would make it a bit harder. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Amy, for that question. The next question we have is from Angela. She says, um, do you have any preferences or tips for using interfacing? Um, so I've had a few nightmares with the iron-on interfacing <laughs> because sometimes it, um, it just... Uh, it's re I feel, find it really difficult to find one that works consistently really well on lots of different materials. Um, sometimes I'll just end up stitching the interfacing on the back rather than trying to iron it on. Um, but just the stuff from, I just get mine from Spotlight, you can buy it off a roll there. So yeah, I don't really have a preference because I haven't found that magic one yet. Um, and it depends on what material it's going on to as well. But even calico can work. Like you can even just use a, a fine calico if you stretch that with onto your hoop on the back, um, that will work as well. Good. Um, we have one more here from Gonzalo. He says, or she, um, what do you re what do you recommend to in to avoid wrinkles from the final piece? Yeah. So. Um stretching it and using interfacing so just making sure that it's stretched well um, and then using the interfacing too um, but making sure that it's not too tight that you kind of stay consistent with your how tight you make it on the frame um, I mean you could get around that problem as well if you was just talking to Carol about stretching it onto the frame um, and leaving it on there to work with um, yeah, so interfacing um, solves that problem. Unfortunately, when you put lots of stitches on the material, it is going to happen. It's just um, a part of part of putting heavy stitching onto material. It tends to pucker a bit, um, but I've found interfacing helps a lot with that, solves that problem. Thanks, Nicole. Um, we don't have any more questions yet. So would you like to you can't really do a demonstration with one hand. <laughs> I can. Um, I'm just still trying to get this computer to start again. <laughs> but what I can, if I can set it up, just bear with me. Sure. Um, I'll see if I can get it to lean against something. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'll just this around. Oh, you know what I have. Hang on a minute. Um, I may be prepared for this. Nice studio. Yeah, it's lovely, except, of course, as well, they've just put on the air conditioner, which is really loud. It's, this no. is just like you know, <laughs> everything that can go wrong is going wrong. Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to... Yeah, so this is my studio at, my, at the art school. Okay, and so you have, do you have a home studio as well? 
We've just moved house and um, I don't have one at the moment. So we're, yeah, we've got to sort all that out at the moment. It's all in boxes until we... Uh-oh. Oh, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can't see you. Oh no, hang on. Oh, yeah, what have I done? There we go. All right, so. Perfect. Understand. Oh my gosh, I'm glad I didn't pack all this stuff away. <laughs> I thought I'll just leave all these things out just in case. Um, so what I had a few notes of things that I was going to show you. Oh, so I don't know whether, um, I don't, I guess it's hard because I don't know how much knowledge everyone has, um, but I was just going to show you just a few tips and things in terms of like the thread dividing. Um, so one tip is you pull, pull the thread from the longer um, section um, of the cover on the thread. Um, and then, yeah, just as I was saying, like about a, a forearm's length. Um, and dividing it, so I tend to divide it into the two. Needles, I don't, I mean needles as well, I tend to have my favourite needles, but again, it depends on, I like the clover needles, but it depends on what material I'm stitching into. I'm just trying to find one of my favourite ones. So this is the quilter's knot that um, I was taught that saved my life <laughs> or saved me lots of time, is wrapping the thread around the needle like so. So that's wrapped around three times and then you gently pull it back down your thread and then you have the knot at the end. Hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, so then you have the knot. So yeah, someone was asking before about kind of whether I stitch the shadow. So yeah, I will tend to stitch the shadow areas first. So this is just um, an part of a portrait um, that I started. And obviously I'm not going to do it all, but just to show you a few Can you see okay? Can everyone see okay? Um, yeah, it looks pretty clear for me. Oh, good. I haven't had any time to stitch for a while, so this is actually quite nice to get to stitch. <laughs> So kind of just, yeah, it's really just like marker points for me that I'll put in um, of the different shadow areas. To be honest, sometimes these will change, like I'll get to a certain point in the portrait and then realize that I need to go back and shift them a bit. Um, but these are just good kind of defining areas so I know where some key shadows are. Um, and that helps as well, like then working out how dark or light other parts of the portrait need to be too. Um, we have Angela who's just asked, is that pattern transferred with the iron on method? Oh, that's what I was going to talk about that. No, so this was done because this fabric, I, I don't know if you can see, but you can see through quite clearly this one. Um, and so this one was just done tracing over a photograph with a water soluble pen. Um, and I just saw someone else's question asking what thread it is. This is the 3771. Um, so this is the dark brown one. Um, that I was talking about that I use kind of for all my defining lines a lot of the time um, and even the areas around the eyes. I tend not to use black so much for portraiture 
um, just kind of referencing back to that idea of painting um, using an umber rather than a black or anything to define lines because black can be quite heavy and strong whereas a brown works in more with your portrait colours I tend to find anyway but you might like to use black. Um, Ashley has asked do you generally work with two strands? Yeah I do Ashley. Um, I tend to work with two strands unless I'm in a really big rush <laughs> and I need to get things done quicker. Um, but the two strands, um, as I was saying before in the presentation, it just helps with the blending. The less strands that you have, the more the colours will blend together. So that, But then some people will use, you know, I've seen some people use um, the full six strands uh, for effect. So it just depends on what kind of effect you want as well. Yep, um, Amy has asked, do you knot off each section of red at the back or join uh, the next? I'll yeah, I'll show you that. Um, I think I was once told by a traditional embroiderer to not worry about it so I've gone with that um, because I guess it's what she was saying was that it was based on back in the day when people learned embroidery and it was about the front and the back being incredibly neat and tidy um, and if you follow my Instagram you will see that my backs are not tidy at all <laughs> um, so I tend to just slip it through and I'll show you that right now because I'm just about coming to the end of this one so hopefully you can see that that it's just kind of a straight stitch and I'm just going back through the very end of the last one so it's a solid line And so what I tend to do on the back is I just slip it through the previous stitches um, and then loop it through to knot. So that's how I tend to knot them. Um, I don't tend to, yeah, I just find that's the easiest rather than trying to knot it, just to keep your stitches nice and tight, um, take it back through, have a loop and then go through and pull it tight and that knots it onto there. So that's, um, yeah, kind of just to show you the outline stitch. What I might start now, um, and I haven't done what I said I do and prepare the, the threads beforehand, but it won't take long. And we'll show you again how to do it. I have a question. Mm. Hi. Um, how, what do you do to protect your fingers? Uh, so I do tend to use... Um, I will use silicon thimbles sometimes, um, but I am a dermatitis prone person, so I find they sweat. Um, so a lot of the time I just suffer, um, <laughs> um, just kind of end up with lots of pin marks and worn out fingertips. And yeah, I, some, as well, sometimes I find thimbles are a bit too intrusive in the process, I guess. Um, so I, a lot of the time I don't, use them I just kind of um, go with it and most of the time I'll use thimbles when I'm stitching on really thick um, fabric and hard, finding it hard to pull through the fabric so that's when I'll tend to use thimbles. Um, so does that answer that question? Yes thank you. No problem. Um, so just talking when I was talking in the presentation as well about that idea of the direction of the stitch related to the contours of the face and the anatomy. So I think understanding and looking at the body parts about how they kind of sit. Um, so for instance, I'm just drawing some curve lines on here. Um, and then just as I'm stitching, kind of thinking about, okay, how, how, does, how does your face, um, your facial structure kind of sits so this you know you've got your risen uh the, kind of the nose that sits up and then this bit will be more flat and kind of heading out that way your cheek is kind of curving around so it's just that idea of okay so this is going to be a curved line that way this is going to be kind of in that direction and then this stitching will be kind of out in that direction 
and a lot of the time I do that as I'm going as well. Um, it's just a matter of, yeah, kind of figuring it out as I go. Sometimes I'll be super organized and figure all that out in my drawing. And another thing, which I'm noticing here because the light, it's okay, but it's not great. If you do want to do a lot of stitching and you want to do stitching at night, do invest in a night uh, daylight, a day lamp. It makes such a difference. Um, and it's much better for, it's gonna not, um, much better for your eyes as well. So when you get these wonderful little knots in your thread, I just stick my needle in and then you tend to be able to pull them out. Just put your needle into the loop and then you can pull them out again. And this isn't really the normal cotton I would use. Um, again, all my cottons and everything are, I went in to try and have a look this week to find them in our um, boxes and it was impossible. So this is um, this is actually a cross stitch cotton. I normally wouldn't use this, but I couldn't find anything else um, that was gonna work. So, um, Nicole, how mm. long did it take you to do your work in the Leicester Prize um, called Women in Progress, which is a self-portrait? Quite a few months. Um, yeah, it, it normally takes me, um, yeah, hours and hours <laughs> to get it done. <laughs> yeah, and that one... I ended up, so that one, I ended up changing it. So I did it and then left it for a while and then came back to it and added all those flowers onto it. So all the flowers that are on there are from found embroideries in um, op shops. So they're from doilies and stuff like that. So talking about that idea of women's work um, mm -hmm. and I guess how it's undervalued a lot and these doilies end up in, um, op shops for 60 cents and things, whereas they've yeah, taken hours and hours to do, um, but completely kind of then disregarded in a way. It's, um, yeah, a bit sad. <laughs> wow. Um, we have a question from Kerry. Mm. Um, is there any rule about the stitch length? What is the longest length stitch you would use? Um, good question. So I tend not to go too long uh, because you kind of, the longer you go, the, what's the word, um, the less sound structural it is. Like, so if you do a really long stitch, I'll just show you as an example. So say if I went all the way out here, um, you can kind of see that that then, like I know it's because I haven't stitched in, but it flops around. Um, so when you do the smaller stitches, you tend to get um, more of a kind of the, the, the stitches um, hold up better and kind of sit on the, the material a lot better. Whereas the um, long stitches, um, they just, you're going to have more of um, kind of shifting of your stitches and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I tend not to do them too long. Um, I wonder if I've got a, a little ruler, I think. No, I mean, these, I'd say these ones are probably about, you know, less than a, I don't know, maybe a centimetre, some of them, but some of them are only about five mil. Um, so yeah, not very long at all. So I've got that line there for the cheek. I'm just gonna define that a bit more with a darker. So this one, this color, I should talk about that. This color that I'm using is the 407. I find it's a good shadow one. It's um, not too dark. It's kind of that shadow area. Um, there's some really brilliant portrait, embroidery portrait artists um, that will, 
do it more like it's a painting. So they may use in painting for shadows, people would tend to use more of a purple tone for your shadows. Um, I tend to just stick with these kind of colors here, the browns and the skin tones. So just knotting it on the back again. Um, Amy has asked, do you often work on numerous pieces at once? Yeah, I do. When I'm, oh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I try to finish one before I start another one, but I will tend to have them, um, I might have one big kind of session where I'll draw a lot of them up so they're ready to go so that I can finish one and just pick up another one and keep going. I get too distracted if I have too many and don't get them finished. <laughs> but it depends what commitments um, I guess I've got going on for shows and stuff. So this is 758. I'll hold this up a bit closer in a minute so you can see. I hope everyone else is stitching as well or anyone that's got stuff. It's a bit like watching paint dry, watching embroidery. I always joke with my partner, you know how they have those reality TV shows that they should have a reality TV show of embroidery. <laughs> It'd be so boring for people. It's almost meditative watching you. It is and it's, um, yeah, it's kind of meditative. Doing it. Um, doing it, yeah. It's the how I took it up again was after I had my son and I needed something that I could kind of pick up and put down while he slept um, in the afternoon. And it was, you know, I, I didn't want to sleep during the day, but I needed some rest time and this was my rest time. So, yeah, it is quite a, a meditative. And, I mean, that's my whole PhD is about arts and health and well-being and there's lots of studies that show that kind of repetitive act of how good it is for you. Mm. Um, there's another question from Kerry. Is this the cell you normally stitch faces? Uh, what was that? Sorry. Is this the scale that you normally ah, um, No, it really varies. Like sometimes I'll do really tiny miniature ones. Um, other times they can be quite big. Uh, so yeah, it really varies. Depends on what it is. Um, a lot of my previous work, I'd put them into um, it was about pop culture and things like that. So I'd put them into these ornate frames and it depended on the frame that would kind of dictate what size it was going to be. Um, so no, it just really depends on what the subject is and how big or small I want it. Um, yeah, I have done some miniature ones. Miniature ones are much harder. Um, you don't have the same um, kind of, yeah, ability to work with lots and lots of detail you're kind of just putting in really basic structures of the face whereas the bigger ones you can um but yeah day medna i did a day medna one and that was on a massive tablecloth um so yeah it just depends um is most of your work portraiture based yeah it has been um i made a covid quilt this year so that was a shift in a new direction decided to make a quilt um, and that had portraiture in it but it was a lot of other stuff as well um, but yeah a lot of it has been portraiture based so far in embroidery anyway um, Carrie has asked what sort of frame are you using uh, so this is um, it's got the hoop and the stand built in um, to the one thing so that's quite a handy little lap one. Nice. Um, Ashley has asked, have you ever embroidered on transparent fabrics? Um, do you have any tips if you have? No, I haven't. Um, there's 
yeah um there are a lot of artists that have done it i think it would be maybe using um i don't know if i mentioned when i was talking about transferring the image um probably the way that you would do that would be using a tissue paper to kind of draw your image onto the tissue paper um putting it over the top of the transparent so if it was like an organza or some other transparent material um, and then t um, stitching in the outline and then tearing away the tissue paper um, but you might almost need depending again how thick um, or um, thin the, the material is and how much stitching you are doing you might need something like there's water soluble um, uh, interfacing so you can Put that onto your fabric and then it washes away in the wash and there's some people that have done some really clever things with that as well um, in terms of kind of stitching all this stuff on water soluble um, it's called solvy i think um, and then washing it away and so then it's just the embroider um, the embroidered elements are the structure of the fabric in the end so I'll try and hold that up as close as i can so can you see, is that focusing? Can you see like the stitching? It's not focusing. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but we can see the stitching, it looks nice and thick. Yeah. Um, so it is, I mean, yeah, it does kind of create its own surface and that's only with two. I mean, you could do it with um, one thread if you wanted as well, but I find two's quite good. And is that, so that's two colors there? Yeah, so we've got, um, that's the 407 and that's a 758 and then I'll just pop in another one as well just to show you 754. Hey Nicole, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you're stitching, do you, are you trying to stitch down like in between like the darker colour of the layer before or are you just stitching right on top of the stitches that you have there? Um, I'm just stitching right on top. Yeah, I tend to find going through them is okay. Um, going through this back through the stitches. I think I did read somewhere that someone recommended, and I can't remember, you either work up through them um, instead of down into them or something. But I, I mean, I've, yeah, I, I guess if you wanted to be really um, get them at really perfect, you could work out that um, and stitch it in between but I tend to find just stitching through it tends to hold up okay um, in my experience I mean every now and then you'll get you know you'll have something that'll knot or it'll pucker or pucker or catch or something like that and then you might have to come back in and cut it out and tweezer it out and unpick it which is annoying but um, I haven't had too many problems with that So I'm just, I'll see if I can get it a bit closer. I'll see, this is not so nice. I can see one person stitching away. Like it's such a nice community thing to see you all stitching. Um, I can see Kathy, your question asking about, am I following a photograph? With this one, I'm not. I'm just, I decided to, normally I would. Um, and I did talk about that in the presentation. Um, I'm just trying to have fun with this one <laughs> um, and kind of experiment with the idea of an unfinished face as well. So I think this one will be, it won't be all the elements of the face. It'll just be a few kind of, um, maybe even just these features here or something. So um, yeah, I'm making it up as I go with this one a little bit. But yeah, normally I would, Kathy. normally I'd definitely be working from a photo I have a question. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, if you were to stitch uh, blemishes or freckles or anything mm. like that, Oops. would you first yeah. do the the skin tones and then go back on top and do freckles or anything like that? Yeah, I tend to find that works a bit better um, just to get the skin tones down first and then come back in with the blemishes and the freckles. Um, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not that great with all that sort of stuff. Um, like I find that quite challenging to get it right. Um, yeah, there's some other artists out there that do a much better job than me. Um, 
at that kind of stuff. But moles and stuff, yeah, I tend to get the basic structure of the skin down and then come back over for the blemishes and things like that. Um, we've got, oh, sorry, you go. I was just going to say, but yeah, you just don't want it. Um, definitely then you'd only be wanting to use either one or two threads because the thicker you make it, the harder it's going to be to get your needle back through it as well and get the refined details. Um, so if it's nice and thin, you'd be able to work over the top quite easily. But if you've got a really thick, you know, you've got a, um, a thicker kind of thread on there, then it's going to be harder to get your needle through um, smoothly to create the details of the blemishes and the moles and freckles and stuff. Um, Nicole, someone's asked what kind and size needles do you use? Uh, yes, yeah, so I use clover needles. I tend to find them to be quite good. And one of those things where I found the perfect packet and I've never been able to find it again. <laughs> um, so I tend to use size nine to 12 um, and they've got a little gold um, tip on the threaded area where the, thre um, yeah, where the, the eye of the needle, that's the word. Um, so that will be a gold one. I tend to find they're quite good. The other ones I love, there's a local company here in Hobart and it's called Threaded Needle um, and they have their own, it's a quilt shop and they make their own needles as well. But yeah, kind of, um, it's that old um, adage too that, if you start off with good materials and tools, it makes your job a lot easier. So do try and um, get some good needles. Um, and as well, really, each time you start a new project, you should start a new needle. There's photos and videos of some of my needles that just end up bent because I'm stitching through um, really heavy materials. I want to try and get the computer going so I can see everyone else's work too and try and give them some feedback. But... Give it a bit of time to think about itself. Um, Kathy has said, are you following a photograph? Do you have any tips for doing eyes? Ah, um, yeah, this one, I'm not really following a photograph. I'm kind of making it up. So it's based on a self portrait. So I feel like I know myself. <laughs> um, eyes, um, so Kathy, I would, yeah, start off with kind of like the outline um, and so work out kind of the eye structure um, and then do, I, I mean, yeah, I kind of do the, the, um, the eyeball first. So the colored part of the eyeball, I would stitch in um, the iris as well, um, just to give me that center point and work out there where the, ref the reflection kind of point is. So you know how most eyes will have um, that highlight point as well. So work out that and mark that out on there. Um, and just remembering too, that a lot of the time up in your eyes, you've got shadows in here and you've got shadows in here. Um, so it's not all white. This section isn't white and even the sections that are white, they're kind of an off white too. So just thinking about your colors um, that you would use for the, the eyes, um, just make sure like that, you're choosing um, the inside of the eye um, would be like a a pinky um, has a kind of the pinky tone to it whereas maybe the um, the rest of the eyeball might be a bit more of a creamy um, kind of yellowy depending how healthy or unhealthy they are um, 
I uh, white as well, so an off white. Um, e ecru, so E C R U is the DMC color. That's quite a handy color to have for eyes as well. Um, tend to stay away again, like the black and white. I tend to stay away from them. They're such strong kind of colors, um, and a lot of you don't find many things apart from um, you know bits of a printed bit of um, paper that'll be that really stark white and black. So just remember to kind of think about your colors and your tones as well when you're doing the eyes. Did that answer that question, Kathy? So can you see that that's, yeah, blending a bit more? <laughs> that focusing a little bit So I'm just going to put in a bit more shadow up in around here as well. And another, I guess another tip um, is when you come to lips, thinking about the curve of the lips too and the shadows. Um, so looking at, yeah, that they're not kind of just straight across. Um, they've kind of got a curve to them. Um, so when you do like the the shadows in here of the lips that you remember that, yeah, you've got that curve of the lip as well. So hopefully you can see that, yeah, the curved kind of lines when you're stitching. How are we going for time? Do people need a break? I don't know what the time is now. But. So it's um it's eleven twenty seven per time. <laughs> yep. Um, and we are scheduled to go for another forty-five minutes, but um we can just play it by ear. Okay. Did anyone want to share their work with me if I can try and see it and ask any questions or tips about some work that they've got happening at the moment? Don't be shy. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Can you see? Sorry. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> All right, so I've done the outline around the tongue and around the teeth for like how much definition do you recommend around like different parts of the body or parts of the face? Yeah, so probably um, starting off with like minimal and then working it up. So I think that line's quite good that you've got at the moment. Um, and now just kind of, um, because you want it quite thin. It can be like those dark lines can be really overpowering when you get to the final kind of image. Um, so yeah, I think that's quite good. And then the, have, what color are you using for that one? Oh, the uh, 3371. Yeah, great. Um, and I mean, yeah, you could go definitely the inside of that mouth when you get into the middle could be black. Um, so just, oh, sorry, no, actually to be black near the edge and then working into your kind of probably your 3371 in the middle. So that just um, whenever you've got like, um, you know, defining kind of shadows, that will be the darker color and then you're working to light and then you might work back to dark again over here, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
and just using that same kind of principle of the blending too. So the the black um, kind of short and long stitch near the edge and then working into the, the lighter colours and then back again. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else want to share their work or have any questions? I'll try and set this back up again without dropping it. I have a question. Mm. Um, so I am actually doing, um, this is the photograph that I'm using. Um, it's not portraits, but as you can see, some of them um, have tons of colors. Mm. Um, so my, my, um, my strategy was to pick maybe a main color of the birds and figure out that main color and then go back and add in details. Is that, that sounds correct? Yeah, definitely. And you could also like, um, yeah, work out a lot of the time with the DMC color charts and the way they used to have it set up um, is that they would group um, kind of shades of colors together in their color chart. So if you've got and my color charts packed away, which is a bit of a pain. Um, but if you've got a particular blue, um, you'll notice that it's a lot of the time it's grouped into six and those are the blues that are grouped near it. You'll be able to see the tonal variations of it works from light to dark. Um, so then you could go like, you know, you do your main color in one blue and then go back and choose another blue in that kind of section. Um, and then they will theoretically work quite quite well together. Um, but if you wanted the contrasting kind of blues or something like that, then you could go and pick another blue from somewhere else on the color chart. But yeah, you're right. Like you've got a lot of colors there to work. <laughs> yeah, work but through. I should still, like even in the main color, I should still uh, um, uh, stitch in the direction of the plumage. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So yeah, sticking in, stitching in the direction of the plumage and even marking that out on your material, um, what way the feathers go. And you can even put in, like if you wanted, um, yeah, you could put in lines of where you think the darker bits would be and the lighter bits. So you could even kind of mark those bits on for a guide too, if you wanted to. Okay, thank you so much. I like that. And or then, yeah, go back in and highlight it with your other blues. Thank you. No worries. There's a few other questions, but I can't quite see them. Georgia, are you able to? Yeah. Um, the next one is from Amy. I paint and stitch flowers, but you have definitely inspired me to try a portrait. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, Kathy says, do you use the same colours for children? Yeah, um, I mean, they have, that's a good question. I haven't really done any children um, and I was thinking for this one, I was going to do my son and then I'm like, oh, that's too hard. I don't know what colours. <laughs> um, so yeah, colours would be a different, um, children would be a different colour palette again, I would imagine. Yeah, I kind of, I haven't done it, but they would be a lighter because they have such kind of delicate, thin skin um and probably even older people too because they have a lot more um you know i'm getting the the sun spots on my hands so yeah they would again have different color skin tones too so i can't tell you what colors to use for that one if i had my color chart here i might be able to have a quick look um but it'd probably even be leaning towards so the one of the highlight colors that i used was the 754 um and as well like a a, a kind of a really light highlight color is the nine four eight so that's like a really um kind of peachy pink color um so that would probably uh, it would be leaning towards that kind of color thanks um annie our ceo here at the lester prize has asked how do you choose your subjects um 
I used to choose them based on, so a lot of my initial work was based on um, pop culture and gender roles in pop culture. Um, when I had my son, I was thinking a lot about he was born into this world kind of defined by um, being a boy and what he was expected to be um, based on that. And then thinking about my own childhood as well, um, growing up and I was always a tomboy um, and thinking, kind of thinking about those gender roles. So the first initial body of work was really based on um, artists that kind of push those gender roles in the pop world. Um, recently I've, shifted more to work towards personal um, reflection. So the self portrait, and then I've done one of Tom um, O'Hearn, one of my friends down here as well. So I'm kind of shifting now more towards people that I know to explore that a bit more. Um, and yeah, it's all shifting at the moment. I feel like there's a new series coming and I've got to figure out what that's going to be and who's going to be in that. There's a few, there's a few other artists that I really want to do portraits of. Um, and talk, I guess whoever I choose, there's some kind of political bend behind it. So the portrait I did of Tom was based on um, down here in Hobart. We've had such a surge in the property market that our old artist studio was just like knocked down to build other buildings. So it was about that idea. Um, and even, you know, my self portrait was about kind of gender issues and women and that, and there's a few other portraits I want to do that again are based on kind of political issues as well as being portraits of people. So, yeah, that's why. Um, do you find painting, I mean, not painting, embroidery, <laughs> um, subjects that you know personally, different experience to subjects that you don't know personally? Yeah, definitely. Um, and as well, um, not just the experience of doing someone you know um, so intimately, but being able to set up the photo um, so that there's a big difference from sourcing your own photographs and taking your own photographs as opposed to um, sourcing something off the internet or sourcing another image. Um, and that's definitely something I want to play with as well is that idea because I'm a trained printmaker and paint as well. So kind of bringing those elements into it as well. So how I could kind of structure the portraits and structure the, the base of the embroidery based on those other techniques in fine art too. So. Um. Kerry has said, do you have a preferred supplier or brand for frames? For the frames? Yeah. Um, the Q-snap frames are probably, yeah, the ones that I prefer generally. Um, you will, with the Q-snap frames, so they're the quilter frames, which are like the polymer plastic tubes, and then you clip things, then you clip these little kind of um, half plastic tubes onto them to pull them tight. You can find them in most quilter shops, I think Spotlight and Lincraft have them as well. Um, but if you do get one of those, you'll need to somehow hold it. So that's the only thing with all of those um, embroidery hoops is that you need, well, you don't, but I do because I do so much of it that I get sore arms and back and stuff. So I tend to find having a stand is much easier. And as well, then you can use both hands for stitching. Um, so if you tend to just use your right hand, you'll find that your right hand will get really sore quite, or your left hand, whatever your dominant hand is, will get sore quite quickly. Um, so just, I do recommend getting a stand. If you really want to get into um, embroidery, set yourself up with a stand um, and a daylight if you're going to do stitching at night to help your eyes too. I'm giving an oh and talk, but it's all from experience. <laughs> Makes it much easier. Look after your health and well-being first. Yeah. Yep. Um, I missed a question earlier. It's from Daniela. Do you do any wrist exercises before an embroidery session? I should, but I don't. <laughs> um, I use, I tend to use... Um, which is a bit worn out and but yeah like a wrist strap so I tend to put one of them on when I'm doing heaps of stitching just to offer that support for my wrists um, but yeah no I should do 
exercises before and after and my um, massage therapist when I ever go and see her tells me that I should so I do I should but I don't <laughs> Let me have a look. Um, Ashley has said, do you have any tips for eyebrows? Yeah, so eyebrows are a tricky one. I think um, the thinner um, strands, like so if you're going to use a one or a two, um, I recommend that. What I tend to do is um, I'll leave that section for the eyebrows um, and then I will come back in so and do like the darker areas with your maybe, I don't know, if it was my brows, it would be a 3771. Um, and you will see that you've got patches of where the skin doesn't meet the eyebrow, but then coming back in and doing that. Um, so filling in the, the strands um, with the skin colour as well. And then even using... A lot of the time when I come to the end of a portrait, I'll just get one strand um, and I'll go along and put extra and no one, I don't think even anyone notices, but I know. So I'll just go and put tiny little strands in. So it looks a bit more natural that it's not just kind of this blocked um, eyebrow, but it's kind of got the hair and even the same with hair, like just then using some single strands to kind of make it a bit more wispy and a bit more hair like. Thank you. Um, Josephina from Chile has asked um, if she can access this workshop later. Yes, yeah, so we're hoping to put it on YouTube. That's our plan. If it all um, ends up saving. with technical <laughs> errors and all. <laughs> Um, Kerry has asked, do you put a shadow between the nose and the centre? of top lip yeah i do so um on this one i'd put um so here of kind of i don't know if you can see but yeah there would be a shadow here um and i've kind of marked where it would be so there'd be shadows there and shadows there as well and that might just be something like a 407 but then this line in here would probably be with a three um, 771 so with the darker one again for that defining line thank you um, Angela have said any recommendations for selecting highlight colors when using vibrant colors yeah so probably the same um, thing that I was talking to um, with someone else about on the DMC colours, they just have a re rearranged it in the shops um, so that it's, I don't know if it's set up the same, but a lot of the time the colours will be blocked in their colour range. So if you see like a section of blues, um, they have it arranged so it's the darkest to the lightest. So just picking the lightest, um, but as well thinking about just that kind of idea of when you've got light reflecting onto something remember there's also the element of whatever's causing the light source so if it was a yeah if it was the sun it might have a, a hint of yellow in it or something like that um if it was like a fluorescent light it might be um a bit more of a whiter light um so then you choose the whiter kind of tone of the colors um but it just depends how strong you want your highlights too like whether you want them to be really obvious or whether you want them to blend in a bit more there's no more questions <laughs> Does anyone want to show their works to Nicole? Cool, we have Carol and Angela. We'll start with Carol first. Great. Um, Various... I've unmuted you, Carol. Oh, I was mucking around with pens to see what would happen with the bleed because I wanted oh, a bleed. Great. Um, yep. So I've got a whole lot, lots there. Um, and this one, I just added a little bit of um, gold paint, you know, that $2 gold paint. <laughs> now I've tried to, but I think when I look at it from a distance, it, because the way I bled it, it looked good, but now I've added that white, I, don't, I think that looks quite uh, scary, really. 
<laughs> I wouldn't say scary, just interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it, and I didn't blend it like you are on purpose. I wanted to have quite strong contrast because that's kind of who I am. Yeah, and that's um, kind of what I would say as well. You know, I've developed my um, techniques and ways based on what I want to achieve, and that's kind of what I want to um, give to all of you as well. That um, give you the tools and some tips, but then I think it's really important to develop your own style and your way of doing things too, um, and the way that I guess blend or the way that I do something, you might do it completely opposite and create some really interesting effects with it. So um, yeah, that's really great. It's certainly, um, when I feel it, it's not an even blend. I mean, the stitching, I've, I went from two threads down to one. Mm. And it's not smooth at all. I mean, I've tried to be directional as well, which is important if you want it to read like lips, but it's not, and I often use one thread, but in this, it's not really particularly satisfactory. But I drew about 10 of those lips, so I've got plenty to practice on. <laughs> <laughs> and are you using the DMC thread? I am. I tend to use that because of availability, like yep. you. I, I, and I do love that Japanese thread. I bought some when I was in Japan, and it's I never lend it to anyone. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I wish, it's yeah. Beautiful. And the, the colours are just a bit more subtle. You can buy it online. Yeah, and I've I've bought some. Someone recommended. Um, oh yeah, but I haven't really got into it at all. Yeah, someone gave me some of that as well, and I haven't really. I just I think I get you get stuck on working with yeah. a particular one, um, okay. and the anchor I find that as well. Like the anchor's a bit too um, coarse for me. Okay. I just um, but. Yeah, I'm, some people love it and swear by it and work with yeah. it. So it just depends on what works for you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to go. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a joy to meet you. And I, I'm sorry, oh. we all the Canberra girls, have, there's a couple of us here. Poor old ANU is being slaughtered because of COVID and um, the school is just slowly disintegrating before our eyes. So maybe we'll have to come to Tasmania and meet you one day. But I have to go and yeah. get it. I have to go and get my hair done because I've got. I'm going to an opening tomorrow, <laughs> so oh. one of my pieces is there. So thank you so much for your time. It's just a thank joy to you. see your face and put a face and a voice to your work because I am. A, I'm a shocking predator when it comes to your site, and <laughs> it could be a bit creepy. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank Goodbye. You. It's lovely to meet the people Bye. in South America as well because their embroideries are just also very inspiring. So I'm going to try to work out how to leave. And thank you for hosting. Bye. 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 Um, Angela, do you want to go next? Um, okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, so I've got this. This is the reference illustration that I uh, did great. back in like April and I've been wanting to sketch her and stitch her for a while. So I'm mm. going to be doing all like reds and maroons. That's Fantastic. my color palette for that. And I can't I might, she might just be bald. <laughs> That's so okay. I didn't, I didn't get into the blending at all, but it's, um, I'm interested in, in testing it out. The quilter's knot was an immediate benefit, so thank you. Yeah, it's just all those little tips to make things easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. It's exciting to see. Um, and yeah, please um, reach out on Instagram or whatever, or look at my website and get in contact if you want anyone wants any further tips or show me your work a lot of the time things get lost for me on um, social media so just say hey I was in the um, the workshop and can you have a look at my work uh, yeah I'm happy to do that thank you thank you thank you um, does anyone else have a question and want to show their work I don't uh, necessarily need to show my work, but I'm just kind of playing around. But I was curious, um, Nicole, do you have any, like, do you try to like limit the amount of colors that you're using within a face not to not overcomplicate it? Or do you just go with like the lighting of the whatever reference photo you're going from? Yeah, I, I think through my experience, um, limiting it is better because sometimes you just end up with like, um, 
yeah, I mean, already, like, I'm not organised. And I've, yeah, you just end up with so many threads. Um, and I've just found that limiting it um, just with the basics. And then you can always come back in with a little bit more. But I think I got caught in the trap um, with some of them that I tried to put too many in there. And it just didn't have that same kind of blending effect. Um, but then some people do chuck heaps of colours in there and it works really well. Um, again, it just depends on what works for you. But yeah, I do find limiting it helps me um, structure it a bit better. Thank you. So that I did a list that I kind of had at the start and talking about on the, yeah, I can't access the PowerPoint now, but um, the talking about the idea of the shadows, the mid-tones and the highlights. So thinking about that with your portrait too, um, or whatever you're doing, um, whether it's a portrait or a flower or a bird, um, thinking about what are the shadows, the mid-tones and the highlights, and then working out your colours for each of those. And you might end up with like, a lot of the time I'll end up with, you know, a couple of colours for the shadows um, and a couple of colours for the mid-tones. So um, yeah, just kind of working out what's going to blend really well. Um, Kerry has asked, how do you store your thread? Um, I tend to try and leave them in the skeins. Um, I have, where's my little box gone? Um, so I do have um, this little box where I put them on to those little plastic, these little plastic cards. Um, but that it gets too kinked for me personally. So I do tend to just leave them on their skeins. Um, when I'm stitching, I will um, be super organized and cut most of the colors and have one of those, you know, those, um, they're like for storing your sewing threads on them, like they're little spools. Um, and so I'll put that on there, divide it up into the colors. Um, and when I'm finished with it, wrap up the, the leftover threads. Um, and then I just store a lot of these in little drawers um, and leave them flat. I just tend to find they get a bit too kinked on the little cards. But um, again, there's people that use the cards and have no problem with it. Maybe it's the way I do it, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, should we wrap up soon? Yeah, I have no idea what the time is, so sure. I, I, I think it's been um, a really informative workshop and it's been so nice to get all of these um, participants from all over the world. Um, yeah, thank you so much for providing all of your knowledge and tips, which I'm sure you've learnt from lots of trial and error. And um, for me personally, I haven't embroidered ever before, <laughs> but it makes me want to delve into the world of it. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, you can, this workshop will go up on our YouTube channel and um, we'd love to see what you guys all create um, with yourself. So please, um, like share anything with us too at the Lester Prize on our Instagram or Facebook and you can tag us too. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you. you can see great. Nicole's work virtually as well. On you can find the Lester Prize virtual exhibition on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.